On the very day of September 11, several commentators drew a parallel with the historical events of Pearl Harbor. And it's a day that will, as was the case with Pearl Harbor, live in infamy in American history. The last time there was an attack like this on the United States was Pearl Harbor. Reminiscent of another terrible day, the attack on Pearl Harbor. But there was also someone on the same day who offered a prediction. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, guess what we did? We went back and found out that yes, the evidence was there. We should have known. And again, I think what we're going to see, even in this instance, this Pearl Harbor of the 21st century is very much the same kind of thing. In fact, the more information that has been emerging about September 11, the more we have come to realize that many different aspects of the two events bear a chilling resemblance to each other. While both events were needed by the U.S. to go to war, in both cases, the ultimate goal was not the one initially stated. Roosevelt knew a surprise Japanese attack would enrage the public and jumpstart the American war machine. In this way, FDR would get backdoor entry into what he really wanted, a war with Hitler. According to their own documents, before 9-11, the neocons knew that a surprise attack, like a new Pearl Harbor, would enrage the public and jumpstart the war machine against Afghanistan. In this way, they would get a backdoor entry into what they really wanted, the war with Saddam Hussein. From the very beginning, there was a conviction uh, that Saddam Hussein was a bad person and that he needed to go. He says that going after Saddam Hussein was topic A 10 days after the inauguration, eight months before September 11th. Before and during the war, the propaganda machine made a relentless effort to create a direct connection between Hitler and Japan. One poll taken immediately after Pearl Harbor showed that more than 60% of Americans believed that Germany was behind the attack. The Bush-Cheney propaganda machine made an even harder effort to create a direct association between Iraq and Osama bin Laden. By the end of 2003, nearly 70% of Americans believed that Saddam was implicated in the September 11 attacks. Top levels of the Roosevelt administration knew in advance that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked. General Marshall and Admiral Stark and indeed FDR indeed knew that Pearl Harbor was being painted for a bombing run by the Japanese. Secretary of State Cordell Hull even knew the exact day of the attack, a week before it took place. Cordell Hull was Secretary of State, and he called me on Saturday mornings, and he started to relate that Pearl Harbor would be attacked on December the 7th. Before September 11, many in the intelligence community knew the attacks were on their way. There was so much discussion about this attack. Everybody was talking about it. George Tenet had some meetings. Other, other analysts had meetings at the White House. Vital information on the Japanese attack was kept from those who could have used it to defend the Hawaiian port and to minimize the number of American casualties. Two men could use that information immediately. Admiral Husband Kimmel and Lieutenant General Walter Short, the commanders at Pearl Harbor. But they never get it. According to Hill, that was no mistake. If FDR and his administration deliberately withheld the vital intelligence from Pearl Harbor, and all the evidence indicates that they did, then it was certainly a deliberate conspiracy to set Pearl Harbor up for a total defeat. Before September 11, important information was kept from counterterrorism czar Richard Clark, who could have organized a defense and even have prevented the attacks altogether. You have to intentionally stop it. You have to intervene and say, no, I don't want that report to go. We therefore conclude that there was a high-level decision in the CIA ordering people not to share that information. In both cases, the pre-knowledge by the U.S. government on the upcoming attacks was denounced in front of Congress. In September 1944, Republican Representative Forrest Harness of Indiana made the first congressional charge about a Pearl Harbor conspiracy. He said that three days before Pearl Harbor, the Australian government had warned Washington that a Japanese aircraft carrier was headed towards Hawaii. But, he said, that information was withheld from Kimmel and Short.
After September 11, Republican Congressman Kurt Weldon denounced the pre-knowledge of information on the upcoming attacks, which was intentionally withheld from the intelligence community. This is an attempt to prevent the American people from knowing the facts about how we could have prevented 9-11, and people are covering it up today. When honest officials stumbled on important information on the Japanese attack, they went straight to their superiors, only to see that information ignored, diverted, or suppressed altogether. The Chief of Naval Intelligence in Washington, Captain Alan Kirk, recognized the message as plans for a bombing raid, but his persistent attempts to warn Kimmel ended when he was assigned to other duties. At Pearl Harbor, the Admiral had no way of knowing that Kirk had been repeatedly refused permission to warn him. In August 2001, FBI agent Colleen Rowley discovered information that could have led to uncover the September 11 plot. But her memos never got past her superiors, while she was prevented from pursuing the investigation any further. Finally, it turns out they were not read by the lawyer and the FBI who had the duty to send those over to the Department of Justice. Hours before the Japanese strike, Roosevelt's chief of staff, George Marshall, became suddenly unavailable, delaying the process of communication within the chain of command. General George Marshall, the man who should have acted, was nowhere to be found. Colonel Rufus Bratton was responsible for keeping Marshall supplied with such vital information. For Bratton, Marshall's sudden unavailability at a time when America was on the brink of war could not have been accidental. In the crucial hours of September 11, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld and other top military became suddenly unavailable, hampering the decisional process within the chain of command. For 30 minutes, we couldn't find him. Withholding information, however, may not have been sufficient to guarantee the success of the Japanese attack. The military capacity of the Hawaiian port was also kept below its requirements. General Short, faced with the need to send out long-range patrols, had only a handful of suitable aircraft. His demands for more were not seen as a priority. On September 11, only four jets remained on alert to defend the entire sector of the country most likely to suffer an attack. I've determined, of course, that with only four aircraft, we cannot defend the whole northeastern United States. President Roosevelt gave direct orders not to interfere with the Japanese attack. President Roosevelt told General Marshall to send a message to the Hawaiian and Philippine commanders, don't interfere with Japan's overt act of war. The United States desires that they, uh, Japan, commit the first overt act. There's no argument about what FDR meant. Uh, he meant that, uh, that the U.S. naval plan uh, to defend Pearl Harbor should not and cannot be executed. On September 11, Vice President Cheney gave a direct order regarding the plane headed towards Washington, which in fact resulted in the plane reaching its target without being shot down. The young man said, Mr. Vice President, the plane's 10 miles out. Um, do the orders still stand? And the vice president sort of whipped his head around and said, of course they do. It was thanks to the indignation for the 3,000 sailors killed at Pearl Harbor that President Roosevelt could finally enter a war the U.S. had been preparing for months in advance. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph so help us God. It was thanks to the indignation for the 3,000 victims of September 11 that President Bush could launch a war that had already been prepared in the smallest detail. CNN and Time Magazine have reported that on September 10, 2001, a military plan to attack Afghanistan had been placed on George Bush's desk to be signed by the President upon his return from Florida. May God grant us wisdom and may he watch over the United States of America. Then came the official commissions, which in both cases were tasked to find out whether there had been a conspiracy by the same authorities that were suspected of having participated in the conspiracy. Just three months after VJ Day, Senator Alvin Barkley of Kentucky convenes the Joint Congressional Committee on the investigation of the Pearl Harbor attack. The committee lays much of the blame on the commanders at Pearl Harbor and largely exonerates FDR and his top advisors. But its conclusions draw charges of cover-up and cronyism. 
gross negligence becomes high treason when the motive is discovered or understood. In July 2004, the commission published its final report. Two and a half million pages of documents. We've interviewed over 1,200 individuals, including experts and officials, past and present. However, the commission report failed to meet many of the family's expectations and concluded that 9-11 was merely a failure of imagination. Published in 2004, the 9-11 Commission Report has become the central focus of criticism by the 9-11 Truth Movement, a movement comprised of thousands of individuals and associations from all over the world, all connected through the Internet. The Commission's report is accused of having simply rubber-stamped the government's version of the events by ignoring all the evidence against it while covering up its most conspicuous holes with a long series of omissions, distortions, and even plain falsehoods. Led by researcher David Ray Griffin, an international panel of 20 experts on 9-11 has compiled a list of the strongest evidence against the official version that has emerged to this day. This evidence is available to the public on their website in four different languages. Despite all the evidence that has emerged in the last decades, there are many who still reject the idea of a conspiracy at Pearl Harbor and prefer to reassert the much more simplistic explanation called the official version. There was no conspiracy. FDR did not know, uh, Cordell Hull did not know, the American government did not know that the Japanese were gonna attack Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. It was a, what has uh, been called a failure of imagination. Despite all the evidence presented in the last 10 years by the 9-11 Truth Movement, there are many who openly support the official version by the government and dismiss such evidence as irrelevant. These people are known as debunkers, as their stated intent is to debunk the evidence presented by the 9-11 Truth Movement against the official version. The most authoritative debunker in Italy is Paolo Attivissimo, a member of an organization called CICAP, which has openly declared war on the so-called conspiracy theorists. Attivissimo has held numerous conferences on 9-11, in which he has covered all the most important aspects of the debate. The most prominent champion for the official version in France is Jerome Quirant, who also wrote a book called September 11 and the Conspiracy Theories. Quirant also participated in numerous conferences and television debates on 9-11 in his own country. But the flagship for the debunkers worldwide is certainly the American magazine Popular Mechanics. In 2006, they published a book called Debunking 9-11 Myths, in which the authors purport to have refuted all the major claims against the official version by the 9-11 Truth Movement. Jim Miggs is the editor of Popular Mechanics magazine. In 2005, he and a staff of reporters decided to take on the factual and scientific claims made by members of the 9-11 conspiracy movement. The results were first published in a magazine article, then more fully developed in a book titled Debunking 9-11 Myths, Why Conspiracy Theories Can't Stand Up to the Facts. I think what Popular Mechanics did with the 9-11 conspiracy theory was just about one of the best things ever done in the history of skepticism. That is exactly how it should be done. Here's the claim, here's the answer. Here's the claim, here's the answer. By the end, they got nothing to stand on. Boom, end of story. But is it really so? The debate on September 11 can roughly be divided into these areas of discussion. We have the four hijackings as the overarching event of the day, and we have the three different locations that were hit by the four airplanes. One of them hit the Pentagon, another crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, the other two hit the Twin Towers in New York. The debate on the hijackings is divided in three parts. The first one focuses on the air defense and whether the failure to intercept the hijacked airplanes was accidental or intentional. The second focuses on the hijackers and whether they were actually aboard the airplanes or just the usual patsies. The third part focuses on the aircraft themselves and whether the four airplanes used in the attacks were the same ones that took off from the airports that morning or were something that only resembled them from the outside. <laughs> 